Hello and welcome to the Racing Writers Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Crandall. My guest this week is Hermie Sadler, one of the pit reporters for Fox Sports when it comes to coverage of the Camping World Truck Series and occasionally the Xfinity Series side as well. This was an episode I was really excited to do because Hermie has become one of my really good friends within the sport and he's always fun to talk to. He always has something funny to tell me, a fun story. And usually we only get a few minutes to catch up on pit road before a race, so I really wanted to get together with him. And so when we when we made our plans, we decided to have lunch earlier this month and chat more in depth about his NASCAR work as well as wrestling. So the first part of the podcast is going to be all about racing, Hermes' work, Hermes' background, kind of how he sees the Camping World Truck Series, and then we're going to go into the second part, which is our mutual love of the squared circle. And we'll wrap back up with more NASCAR talk and everything coming down the road. But before we get started, I want to say thank you to those who continue to subscribe to the podcast and have already left a rating and review. I promise this is not for my own vanity. I really want to grow this. And by you subscribing and spreading the word, telling people about the podcast, leaving ratings and reviews, that helps a ton. So if you haven't done that, I hope you do. And to everyone who has, I thank you. But now let's get to the show. Here is Hermie Sadler on the Racing Writers Podcast. I'm just glad we're finally getting to do this. I know. I've been wanting to do it for a while because yeah. we can have hour-long conversations. We could talk for days. <laughs> so that's, that's good. That's why yeah. we're friends. Yeah. Let's start with, um, I want to start with your broadcasting. How do you like being on that side of things? It seems like you get more comfortable with it every year. You have yeah. more fun. It's certainly not something I ever dreamed I'd be you doing. You didn't think you would do it. No. <laughs> I certainly don't have the accent for it. <laughs> um, but i tell you how that started right out of the blue. It's probably been... 15 years ago now. I, I don't remember say, the exact it's, it's, year. It's been a while. But I was in Michigan racing, and there was a truck, uh, excuse me, a Xfinity Series race that night at Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And some something happened with some talent mix-up that they had. And Artie Kempner, who is one of the directors for NASCAR on Fox, on Fox yeah. we have a connection because we both have children with autism. Mm-hmm. But Artie called me like on Saturday afternoon at the racetrack and said, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I just finished practice. He said, I need you to fly with these guys to Kentucky, and I want you to be in the booth for the Xfinity race tonight on FX. And I'm like, Artie, two problems. Number one, I've never been on TV before in that way. Yeah, you had not done anything Not, not like anything. That. And I said, number two, I don't have a sport coat. And he said, sport coat we can fix and don't worry about it, just go. Mm -hmm. So I went and did the booth for that race that night with no training, no preparation, just just on a whim and went and did it. And that kind of triggered the start of, because I was still racing, not full time, but racing a lot. And, you know, and then I started, I, I went and did that one race and that led to other races, which led to me doing the old race day shows on speed. When I did the, you know, I used to drive the, the speed car, and yeah. I did the, the set with uh, Daryl Waltrip and John Roberts, and then, uh, you know, and then um, as speed, I... Speed, it's funny, because when I was looking things up to try and get a good idea of when you exactly had started the broadcasting yeah. stuff, and in your Fox biography, it mentioned Speed, and I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, I forgot that yeah. we used to have so much with Speed. Speed, and they travel the whole yeah. set, the whole big footprint to the track, yeah. and so I did... A lot of the trackside shows I did, you know, the pre-race, yeah. the post-race victory lane shows. I did, I did those, and so, and then uh, so I did those for years. And then as I got older and kids got older, and when I wanted to kind of slow my schedule down a little bit, I've kind of migrated to uh, doing trucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the trucks. I love the truck schedule. Uh, I still get a chance. I'll do three or four Xfinity races this year, yep. also, but. But I didn't want to travel quite as much as I was doing, you know, back seven, eight, nine years ago. So just doing the trucks and kind of that being my home and then also doing some other stuff from time to time is kind of the right fit of what I like to do and kind of what I wanted to do at this stage of my life. How long do you feel it took you to kind of get comfortable doing this? Because, again, you had no really experience. You know, I, it's, it's up for others to yeah. judge how well they think I do or how bad they, they yeah. think I am. Uh, what I've, I've done the same thing since I started and that is really not take myself too seriously in doing it and I've always tried to regardless of what role I was playing 
I try as best I can to talk as if I'm at home on the couch trying to explain to a friend of mine what's going on and why. So I don't, you know, I don't try to be fancy. Yeah. I don't wear makeup. I don't do all those crazy things. Um, to me, it's always been, you know, and, and I've not only raced for 25 plus years, but I own cars at times. Now I've been involved in broadcasting. So I, everything that's everybody's going through at the racetrack in some way, shape, or form, I've I've done it, and I think that gives me a good, you know, insight as to some of the challenges the teams face, the drivers, sponsor issues, car owner issues, all those kind of things. You feel like you have a good kind of grasp on the garage because you are driving. Like people know you. Do yeah. you feel like it's easier for you to go in and? and I think it's I think it's easier because. Um, they, I think they respect me. Yeah. Uh, because I'm not one of these guys that I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the truth, but I'm gonna tell the truth in a way that I'm gonna try to help the drivers and help the race teams. I'm not one of these uh, people that want to get the scoop. I, I'm not gonna because I know how that can be at times when you're trying to get a story and you're trying to get be the first one to tell a story. If the right people hadn't already signed off on a deal or the right things are not done, you can really mess up somebody's situation yeah. when they tell you something in confidence. So So you're not here to ruin anything. You just wanna I'm I'm I know things yeah. just like everybody else does three three weeks before they happen. But I'm not one of these that's gonna get on social media or get an interview and say, Hey, so and so is gonna sponsor so and so or so and so is gonna drive so and so because until those people are ready for that to be announced, I don't want to be the one that could potentially mess up somebody's yeah. opportunity. It's happened to me through the years. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to try the best I can to let people at home know what's going on and why. And I'm going to try to project it in a way that's always going to be positive for the race teams. Do you, what's the most challenging thing, challenging thing about the whole broadcasting field? The travel. Yeah. The, once I get to the racetrack, it's easy yeah. for me. Again, because I follow it every day anyway. Uh, when I get to the racetrack, I go in the garage. I always follow up. I try to stay current. Because even though that's one thing that's a little bit frustrating by some of my co-workers at times, is just because you race for 25 years doesn't necessarily mean you know what's going on today. Because things, that's why I ran, I ran one cup race last year at Martinsville. And I didn't win. I ended up like 10 laps down. Whatever. But I learned so much that weekend about the cars, the track, the tires, all the different things that it gave me a, you know, kind of gave me a refresher mm -hmm. on, you know, what was going on. And so. And even if you're not behind the wheel, though, the fact that you'll go walk around the garage. You have to. Yeah, it's all about. It's you all have about to know. Talking. You have to know the drivers. You know, I don't know these young kids personally, yeah. so I've got to do as best I can to get to know these guys personally. Where'd you come from? What's your story? Uh, and not be afraid to go ask those crew chiefs, why are you hey, here? what's going on? And I can go ask a crew chief, whether it be before the race, in the garage, or during the race. I feel like I can, because they know that I'm going to ask the right question, hopefully not at the wrong time. I know when not to talk, you know, so because I've experienced all that. And so I think for the, you know, for the, for the period of time I've been in and around the garage, they know that I'm there to help. Um, I can be a tremendous outlet. You know, for the teams to get information to the public, um, but I'm also there to to do a job, and my job is to for the people that are watching the truck races on FS1 for me to always be able to tell them something or show them something, or for them to pick up on something that they have not picked up on, where they would not have picked up on it had I not been at the racetrack. But feel free to eat. Going back to what you said before about the travel, I guess that kind of makes the truck schedule perfect for you in that sense it, you know really uh, for all those years or for many years I got spoiled because I was doing the cup stuff you know the the pre-race show race day the victory lanes practice shows qualifying yeah. shows and I was traveling with my brother in most cases he had a private plane we could leave Emporia I could leave a day later than most we'd fly home the same night so I'd get home a day earlier than most and then when he went back to the Xfinity series he quit flying the plane full time, and so travel it became, you know, a commercial air travel, as you well know, yeah. is a hit or miss proposition. Um, you know, they've got charter services, but they're in and out of 
Concord or Charlotte area. I live in Emporia, Virginia, which is a, about a four-hour drive. So it just made the, 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 the travel part of it challenging. And then as my kids got older, you know, my youngest, Naomi, is a, is a good little athlete, and I've enjoyed watching her play sports, and I want to be to as many of her games as I possibly can. My middle daughter has autism, so every night or day that I can spend with her, you know, is worth it to me to, to be there. And then, of course, Cora is already going in her senior year at North Carolina at UNC, and so she cheers, and I want to go to as many basketball games, football games, and all that as I can. So, you know, I've been selfish my whole life, you know, about what I wanted to do and how, but in recent years I've realized that um, being at some of these other events it's more important to me than doing something that it maybe I want to do, so I've had to adjust my way of thinking. You want to eat? We can pause. No. Okay. Speaking of the truck series, if the thing that most people like is it's a good mix between those veterans and those young guys. What is your relationship like, obviously, with the veterans? And then I guess it has to be enjoyable to be able to cover these young guys as they start moving up the ranks. Yeah, the veterans, Crafton, Sauter, uh, those types are so good for the sport still to have them around because they've got so much knowledge uh, and they if, if some of the younger ones were more willing to learn lessons from some of the veterans whether it be on the track or off the track uh, I think they'd be better off because of it but some of the young ones either are too shy or afraid to go talk to, to the veteran drivers or they're scared you know they don't you know or, or too introverted yeah. to do that and we've seen sometimes you know, this year, I go back to the Noah Gregson, Johnny Sauter issue at Dover, and I think ultimately that was a big lesson for Noah Gregson. He turned around and helped him turn that into a win, you know, at our next race. So, um, so the, young, the, the veteran guys, they know, they've been there, they know the ropes, they're easy to interview, they're, they're predictable sometimes, but still we need, to, we need to spotlight them, especially when they're running good. The younger ones... It's a little bit frustrating for me because some of them have much more personality than they're willing to convey on television. Some of them, when I speak to them, not on TV, they laugh, they joke, they play, they're fun, and then when the TV, when the light turns on, they they freeze. And I think the people at home want to see or hear that emotion and that personality. So I always try to make it a point to do the best that I can to try to take some of that personality that I know they have and show it to the people at home because we need for our fans to connect with this new generation of racer. Why do you think it is? Why, why do you think that they get so closed off when that when that light turns on? Are they, are they just sponsor away? In, in my case, I had to be outgoing when it came to sponsors because I'm the one that went out and got my sponsors. And that's what my sponsors liked about me. Some of these kids' cases, it's got to do with the fact that... They, they worry so much now, they, maybe? They, I think some of it is maybe they never really had to go out and get the sponsor. They kind of had a situation where they were placed in this environment and they just like, okay, go race. And or um, I think they maybe get overwhelmed at times with the pressure of where they are and what they're doing. And because, you know, that's a, in a lot of cases, a short window of time of opportunity for these young kids to, when everything matches up perfectly with the talent, with the ride, with the sponsor. You don't have forever at a young age to do it or to do it and move up the ladder. So I think a lot in a lot of cases they, uh, they're they really nervous and they really rather say nothing than to yeah. say the wrong thing. And in a way, that's a shame. I think you ought to try to be yourself. We've only had, what, a handful of races this year. Kind of how do you see this, this year shaping up? You've got kids like Noah and what Todd Gilliland and Harrison Burton but you still got Johnny out there winning races and and Thor Sport now with Ford that kind of unique situation kind of how do you how do you see this year shaping up right now I see it as a battle between Johnny Salter and Noel Gregson yeah that's kind of the way I see it shaking down at Homestead and there'll be some others yeah that will progress through the course of the season I mentioned Thor Sport Crafton is just he's been top five-ish but not typical yeah. crafting and I'm you know you those Fords aren't as strong as the Toyota. Ben Rhodes has got a bunch of potential. I think he's finally calmed down and realized that you know he's he got it got himself in some bad situations, you know, last year. And I think he's learned from them. But until the Fords catch up with, with those teams, 
Um, right now, I see it as Noel Gregson and Johnny Salt. You still race occasionally. Is that just a, a deal of if you have funding, you still like to get behind the wheel? It's a deal or? where if I can make some money, I'm going to yeah. do it. You know? so, cause, so you don't, like you still want to get behind the wheel when you can? Well, I'm, I'm going to race uh, later this year at Martinsville in the yeah. cup race, just like I did last year. I've had a 20-plus year relationship with the Virginia Lottery, and that is a racetrack they want me to race at. We do some promotions through the lottery. I can go out. I don't have to worry about points. I don't worry about how I run necessarily. Yeah. I want to. I don't want to embarrass myself. Right. But most of the guys and girls that I race with know that at my age, racing once a year in the Cup Series for me to go out like I did last year. I hadn't raced and hadn't raced a Cup race in six or seven years. To go out at a place like Martinsville and just not get in the way, you know, <laughs> was you know was a uh, was an accomplishment. So, but I really enjoy doing it. I enjoy doing it because of the lottery. I enjoy doing it to get back out there and have some fun with a lot of the guys and gals that I grew up, you know, racing with and still have fun with. And, um, you know, it's a lot more fun these days because there's no pressure. Kind of an off-the-wall question. I was When I talked to Elliot a couple years ago for kind of like a more of a background piece on him, he mentioned, you know, obviously you guys come from a racing family. And he mentioned when he was only like maybe seven, his first go-kart race, he got placed in, I think it was Upper your class. age group. Yeah, yeah, he got placed yeah. in your age group. And he said that your advice Flipped to him... Flipped in the first corner. Yeah, he said your advice to him was, look, start in the back, gain some experience, you know, just learn. Right. And, of course, he said he didn't do that. He went out and totaled the thing. We were at, remember? I remember it just like that. Uh, I had a go-kart a couple years before he did. And so he had to have one, the young brat brother. Yeah. Hope he's listening to this. <laughs> uh, but he had to have a go-kart. So we got him one. And the first time we went to the go-kart track with him, the racetrack was in Broadnax, Virginia. A little dirt track. And I, I don't really remember why there was, because there was a big crowd of carts that showed up every Friday night at that track. But for whatever reason, uh, the first Friday night we showed up with him, there were no carts in his age group. That's what he'd said. Yeah. So there was about 15 in my age group. So we all agreed with permission from the other racers and track officials and all that we just let him race in our class with the understanding being he was going to start in the back and not only start in the back but start about a half a straightaway behind us because he was lighter hmm. I, don't, he, see, I don't think he mentioned that i'm gonna have to bring that up to but, him now he didn't say he had to start you know he was supposed to start he was supposed to start way, way behind back. us because he was lighter so came around to start the race because i was starting i don't closer to the front i'm not saying i was on the pole but closer to the front but we went in turn one and he drove through the infield, through the mud, back up on the track, and clobbered four or five guys. And we were running for points, running for championships. And he hit carts, flipped, broke the header pipe off his engine, broke his cart, all that, and he cried. <laughs> so that was his uh, that was his first attempt at driving a go-kart. And I cannot wait for you to ask me, can you tell me the first time Elliot Salah drove a stock car? Because that story is better than that. Well, go ahead. Oh, you want to know the first time Molly yes, Sala drove a stock car? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, fast forward several years later, I'm racing late models between Orange County Speedway and South Boston Speedway. We're going back and forth. So, and Elliot used to go with us to uh, to test. We used to test on Wednesdays. Okay. So, back in those days, in the late model days, you would go to the racetrack and practice on Wednesdays, and you come back and race on Saturdays. But well, Elliot was still racing go-karts, and there was a quote-unquote crew member on my late model stock car team. So we get ready to go. There's a 200 lap race coming up at Orange County Speedway. So we have a, a practice on Wednesday. We load up the car, take it, and we I practice all day on Wednesday getting ready for this race. Well, we get done. We're starting to load up. Elliot comes over. My parents are gone on a Shell, Shell Petroleum convention. So they're, at, they're not at home. So anyway, we get ready to get loaded up. Elliot comes over with a phone and says, Daddy wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay. Yes, sir. I want you to let Elliot drive your car a couple laps today. I'm like, Daddy, we've got a 200 lap race Saturday. He says, I don't care. Let him drive your car. Okay. So, Elliot, without me even knowing, he's bought a helmet, he's got a suit, he's got all these things. So, we put him in my car. Here are your instructions, Elliot. This other car is practicing too. Go out, run around the bottom, 
go slow, take your time, and if any, and we got radios now, we can talk, and if anybody else comes on the track while you're on the track, come off, and then you can go back when they quit. We'll make a long story short, he gets out there and he starts picking up speed, picking up speed, picking up speed, starts sliding the tires a little bit sideways. Well, a guy named Kirk Leon from Durham area comes off turn four, spins out. So Kirk, so I'm on the radio, Elliot, come in, come in, come in. He's not listening to me. So Elliot comes off turn four, gets loose, bags my car into the wall, bam. Kirk Leon comes around, T-bones my car in the door. We totally lost two cars, my car and Kirk Leon's car. So my dad had to replace my car and buy Kirk Leon a car. So that was his first day of driving a race car, which went about as well as his first day driving a go-kart. But the good news is uh, he improved a lot through the years. Yeah. I was going to say, what's it been like, kind of, the two of you? How, how much, first, I guess, how much have you been able to race together? I mean, obviously we were actually teammates at Diamond Ridge Motorsports, uh, 96, 97. And, um, so what's it like? What is, what it is was that, great. Yeah, what's that relationship like it, having to, to both of you come up to kind of together and race was, together? As, you know, the age difference has always been, you know, the six years between us. So competitive-wise, you know, we never really played sports against each other, and it never really was a real competition thing between us. We've always been more of a... Well, that's what he said. He said you know, there's never really been help, competition. I'll, I'll help you as much as I can help you. You help me as much as you can help me. And and we've never... There's enough things going against you in this sport. So there was no need for us as brothers to go against each other, and we never did. Yeah. Well, let's pause and eat, and then we'll talk some uh, We'll talk some wrestling. All right. <clears throat> You're at SmackDown, right? Tuesday night. Tuesday night. What do you think of the... What do you think of it right now? We just came off WrestleMania. I don't watch enough, to yeah. be honest with you, anymore to, like... So not every week. Elliot and I took his son, Wyatt, my youngest daughter, Naomi, backstage, and, like, I used to know everybody. Now I know, like, ten people back there. But, you know, the Armstrongs of Road Dog and Scott are both... It's odd to see them backstage with neckties on. You know, so that was uh, that was fun, and a lot of the people that, or well, several people that that I worked with through when I was actually doing live events for TNA, Samoa Joe, um, AJ Styles, some of those, I, you know, they're now you know on that big stage as well. So it's really fun to see them, especially those guys I knew way back, you know, 10, 12 years ago. They were really putting in the work. And you never know if you're going to get that get that break. But <clears throat> I know very little about the actual storylines and yeah. what's going on, you know, with the product. To me, it's more of a a social thing. Go speak to people I hadn't seen in a long time. Got to catch up with Jeff Hardy, who's a good friend, a little while. Um, and it's the first time I'd seen him wrestle since he'd been back live, yeah. you know, in WWE. So that was fun. He's, he's crazy. He is crazy. He, uh... You have no idea. <laughs> so what did you think of that show, though? Oh, I just enjoyed being it. back and, I enjoyed and just it. being able to I take that it. in for an night. The crowd, um, you know, one thing not to not to flip back over to NASCAR, but one of the one of the issues we have is connecting with or trying to keep or get younger people involved in the sport. I think that's a perfect connection. And and, and and I went to that show Tuesday night. And it was kids everywhere. Yeah. You know, and when the kids come, the rest of the family comes. So I still saw the. You know, the 60-year-old out there that was still way into it. And I also saw the, you know, the 35-year-old parents, you know. And then I also saw 8, 9, 10-year-old kids all enjoying it. And I think that's, say what you want to about professional wrestling. They've done a really good job over the years of cultivating that next generation of fan, whether it be not just the show itself, but merchandise and interactive things and things like that. They've done a good job with that. So it's funny you mentioned that. So last year when you introduced me to Heyman, to, to Paul Heyman oh, yeah. in Richmond, and I eventually ended up talking to him for a story because he, of course, does some marketing what for Richmond. What an interesting guy, huh? I love him. Oh, I love him so much. The walk. He's got the walk. He does. You know what? He's got was, the second best walk in wrestling next to Vince. Yes, next yeah. to Vince. You know what's so funny? The first time I saw Paul that weekend, I said, oh my God, he walks exactly like he yeah. does on TV. It's real. He's got, he's got the, like a peacock. Yes. Yeah. 
So when we talked though, he said that one of the things that he, one of the thing, the points that he made to me was what WWE does so well in terms of the fans is every year at WrestleMania they have access to yeah. the whole big fan. I went this year because right. I went to the Hall of Fame with Jeff Jarrett. So you've so seen I saw it. all that, yeah. All that interactive stuff mm-hmm. that they do for the fans. And Paul was making the connection that, you know, if the WWE can do that so well, it made me think. NASCAR, like we need something like that in NASCAR. Like we have all these pre-race concerts and things like that, but we really don't have, like you know, maybe the week leading into the Daytona 500 or our mm-hmm. biggest thing. Like we don't have all of those big fan events yeah. to really kind of you know, get those kids and get the and even and even the like you said the the older generation that's still really into it. It's been a long time since I've been. Probably the last last WrestleMania I went to was probably 2002. With the Rock, or when it, whenever it was in Anaheim, mm-hmm. back in those days, I, we went up there with him for that. But that WWE just takes over the whole city, mm-hmm. like it was in New Orleans this time. I mean, the whole city was WWE everywhere. Like sometimes you go to a NASCAR race, I like go to Chicago. I don't see you any don't billboards in Chicago that the race is going yeah. on a little bit outside of the city. But they they really do. They mean, and I noticed the other night at SmackDown, like even my daughter Naomi, she's 15. Not a huge fan. She knows I have a lot of friends because a lot of the friends are they come stay at our house or we vacation with them, whatever. But she was like almost like a first time for her, and she was really amazed at the young uh, females coming up in WWE and their wardrobe. And she was just mesmerized by the bright colors and the lights on the shoes and all these things that these girls had. And you know that you know that's what got her. You know, and you take little, you know, Elliot's little boy Wyatt. You know, then, you know, then he interested in other things. But it seems like they've got a little something for everybody yeah. to keep them interested in. And uh, but they, I've said for years that like him or hate him, Vince McMahon is a genius mm-hmm. to make the money and build the company he's built with the people that he's built it with. I mean, some of these people, if they didn't have professional wrestling, what would they have? And he takes them all. They find a way, and they, you know, they um, they continue to evolve in a, in, in a good way. We could sit here for hours and talk about the things that WWE does that maybe we in racing need sure. to rip off. But so you and Elliot have obviously been fans for a long time. But I'm curious when. Explain to me when that went from you guys being fans to how you actually got into wrestling. You like you, you know you can name drop people, yeah, and yeah, you even yeah. even in TNA you were a part of the business mm-hmm. and I think you also wrestled a little bit like how in the world Ron Killings whipped me all over the auditorium <laughs> in Nashville but how in the world did, did well, all of that stuff we, we grew up we grew up fans back in the old NWA days I mean, my dad used to take us back to the Greensville County High School gym Wahoo McDaniel Black Jack Mulligan you know way before your time but started and then so I was always a fan and then as I got older there was uh the Hebner twins, Dave and Earl Hebner, lived in Richmond, Virginia, and they reached out to us sometime about coming to a show, a WWE show. This was probably mid '90s, something like that. And although I'd been, you know, and when you're in NASCAR, people, you know, when people start hearing your name and know who you are, then you start calling about tickets and different things, and they're like, "Well, hey, you know, they want to meet you," and so you go in and. You start going backstage, and you start meeting people, and this, and that, and the other. So just kind of a snowball effect as far as that. But uh, one of the people that I hit it off with the best early on during those days was Jeff Jarrett. Jeff was a kind of intercontinental champion, you know, and was just getting his feet wet, uh, just getting his first kind of legitimate push in WWE. And we had a lot in common. You know, we were about the same age. Our wives close to the same age. We had young kids about the same age, and so we had a lot in common. So we kind of, if you, I guess you could say, I became closer personal friends with him, whereas some of the other guys and girls were more acquaintances, you might say. Well, then when he, Jeff and his dad Jerry, uh, decided to launch uh, TNA uh, Wrestling 2002, one 2001, 2002, uh, they wanted me to uh, do what I could help get the promotion off the ground or try to get some crossover uh, appeal to some of the NASCAR fans. So Sterling Marlin and some of the other I know um, uh, Austin Dillon's been a couple times Juan Pablo Montoya. A lot of these guys went to some of the shows 
and did some things so we could get them on TV and kind of get more eyes on it. I ended up wrestling two pay-per-view matches with with Ron Killings, R Truth, yeah. as they're called. Uh, so I did I did that back in those days and just through the course of time. Um, and then from there, you know, I did uh, I was in charge of the house shows for TNA uh, for a territory, basically Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And so there for about three years, I was doing, you know, funding live events. And it was a, it was a business, and we, it ran like a business. And so I got to work, you know, real closely with uh, a lot of the people in the industry, not only performers, but, you know, behind the scenes, backstage, production people, all those kind of things. And I'm the kind of person, if I meet you and I like you, you know, I mean, and I consider you a friend. And a lot of these friendships have... You know, have grown over the years as, as we've all gotten older and had kids and I think it's neat that we can still you know stay in touch and and um, and do things together and I, I consider a lot of people uh, in the wrestling industry to be some of my best friends. What was it like getting in there with uh, with Ron and getting bumped around and did it was you, very did painful. Train? Yeah did you train like oh my god I can't Not even imagine. A, I mean, it, we actually did it all in one day. Uh, really? That particular match was um, at the Civic Auditorium in Nashville, and I flew in earlier that day. I got to give Ron all the credit. You know, he he put he put the match together, and all the training that I had, he gave it to me. Uh, but it was almost over before it started. The, the match called for us to have kind of like a little standoff at the beginning of the match, and he popped me. And um, I guess you could say, and I hate I hate to say this to people who really think wrestling is still real <laughs> but the punch was a little stiffer than it was yeah. supposed to and or maybe I leaned into it a little bit or something mm-hmm. but he about knocked me out uh, oh right gosh. and it took me a couple minutes to get my bearings back and I told him after the match backstage I was like dude if I know you're going to hit me on the chin like that I at least would have put my hands up you know uh, but it was great it was very educational I learned a lot I have a tremendous amount of respect for the athletes uh, that the performers are, and in, in a lot of ways similar to NASCAR, the ones that can connect with the fans at the right time and capture that lightning in a bottle is are the ones that really can you know, transcend wrestling, like some of them have done, like you know Rock and to a certain degree Steve Austin, some of these other people. They've used it as a platform and then mm-hmm. carried them on to bigger and better things, and some of them are lifelong performers in the wrestling industry and you know nothing wrong with that either how many times did you get in the ring a uh, total of about five probably yeah, but, but one that one thing I look back now and I was like how did I have time to do all of that but we we're building up this first pay-per-view like I had to make five appearances like for the build-up mm-hmm. some of it was just you know verbal altercations and things backstage vignettes and all that but all this thing built up over five weeks that I had, wherever I was at, I had to fly to, because in those days, TNA was doing weekly pay-per-views, Wednesday night, 9.95 pay-per-views at the Nashville Fairgrounds. So, in, into the build-up for this big match I had with uh, with Ron, I had to be in Nashville every Wednesday night, you know, for about a five-week period. You know, in those days, I was racing and doing all that too. So, but I, I'm like everybody else. Everybody wants to do what somebody else did. Yeah. Race car drivers want to be wrestlers, or race car drivers want to be professional golfers. Golfers want to drive a race car, and so I always wanted to to wrestle one time, and I got a chance you got to do to, it. You got to and experience it. It was fun, painful but fun. What was? Do you remember what the storyline was? Um, it was more of a more or less they were pushing. More than anything else, we were just trying to push the show. Mm-hmm. We were trying to get mainstream media to cover. TNA wrestling, which, as you know, in the wrestling industry, there's this global phenomenon, WWE, and everybody else is starving for a little bit of attention on the side. So the point was to try to get NASCAR, which NASCAR really was helpful to me back in those days, sending cameras and shooting things I was doing at the shows to get more eyeballs on this product. And then it just boiled down to uh, a wrestler beating up a race car driver. Was my record is officially I won because Ron got DQ'd um, when the match was over. So, although uh, I was defeated physically, 
uh, the record book state that I right, that I want. That's, that's all that matters. That's all that matters is the record book. You mentioned working with The Rock. I've seen your commercials, your car dealership yeah. commercials. How how did you get? How did you make that happen? Yeah, and well, I go like? back to the Hebners, um, Dave and Earl Hebner, back in those days, in the late nineties. Uh, Rock was just getting going, was just starting to kind of take off, and Dave Hebner, who had been a main event referee for years, uh, was one of the backstage agents. He handled all the uh, per diem for the talents, work, handled hotels, do all that. And I just called him up one day and I said, I want to find somebody, because I had car dealerships at the time, I said, I want to find somebody that I can provide a car to and exchange for that, that they will do commercials for my dealership. And he said, it's easy, rock. And, and I didn't know a lot about him then. I mean, I, I followed it, so I, he, but he was just starting to kind of, you know, get traction. So I met with him at a show, and then um, one of the times they came to Greensboro, I called Rick Hendrick, and I used Terry Labonte Chevrolet uh, in Greensboro that Rick actually owns uh, to cut the commercials that day, and then that turned into a friendship for for Rocky and I. And so. I bet once every six, eight months, I would get a new Cadillac and doll it up like he liked it. And I'd drive to, at that time, he lived in Davie, Florida, outside of Fort Lauderdale. i take him a car, bring the other one back. And we did that for several years until I was getting out of the car business. And it got to a point where he didn't need anybody to give him any cars anymore. He could buy all he wanted. Because so when I first started, you know, he, 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 you know, it was a mutually beneficial yeah. relationship. So I'm assuming none of the cars that you gave him were the ones that Stone Cold was running like monster trucks over and stuff. No. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> but actually, I, I really, if you, and I'm sure you do, if you know Rock's story, mm-hmm. you know, from his childhood growing up and where he came from and success he's got, is really a, you happy for a guy like that that was willing to put in the work, mm-hmm. you know, to, to get where he's at. And I guess it's safe to say now he's probably the biggest box office attraction in Hollywood. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, there, and speaking of his story, it's, there's a reason his production company is called Seven Bucks Productions. And I just, that's so inspiring. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Can you tell the story? I know we've talked about it a little bit, but can you tell the story on air of how there was almost a wrestling race team? Or what, what can you say about it? No, that? I can <laughs> talk about it. It was, a, it was an unfortunate situation. Rock and I had become... You know, pretty good friends over those couple years. Uh, he and Danny came to watch me race. Danny was his first wife. Uh, they came to watch me race at Homestead, probably 2000, right in there. Uh, like we like people to do, he comes to the racetrack, is blown away by the, you know, by the, you know, spectacle, uh, spectacle of, it. of it. And, and he's been to quite a few races. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He's he's given given the command a couple yeah. times over the years and all that. But long story short, he comes to the racetrack. He loves it. We start having conversations. We put a deal together. This was back in... 2001. Early 2000, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I made a deal. We bought Joe Bessie Motorsports, bought a shop, did all that. Had all this stuff going. And at the 11th hour, uh, Vince came in and, and either said, where's my portion of all this? Or uh, you're not doing this as long as I own you. Yeah. Type thing. So it was never anything personal. It was disappointing for me because of all the stuff we had done and all the people in the NASCAR industry that I knew that it had negative, negatively impacted. Uh, but I understand, you know, I understand. Uh, but but it never happened. Uh, that was a storyline that Vince McMahon squashed. <laughs> So there was a race shop, and you'd bought a, and you'd bought some cars and whatnot. How how much further did that get to? Well, I went I went immediately. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to say because I've said it on other interviews. That, that whole uh, debacle cost me about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars because I still to this day and was then making my living for the most part in the NASCAR garage. So I was not going to back off on a commitment I had made to somebody. You know, in the NASCAR garage. So the people that I had promised jobs to, I paid them until they found another job. Uh, I paid for the shop until I was able to sell it. I liquidated everything that I had uh, purchased and bought. And it was some tense times for Rock and I down through the day because you know Vince put a strong arm on him and said, "Not only are you not doing this, stay away from Hermie Sadler." 
you know, because I like have some kind of cancer or something, you know. But over the course of time, we've mended all those fences, and you know, I'm happy with what I'm doing. He's obviously done, you know, done great, and I wish him all the best. There was also what a SummerSlam car that you drove, I believe, at Bristol. Bristol, yeah, I don't remember the exact year for that. Um, so there's again, there's a lot of interconnecting racing and wrestling here. Yeah, what I remember most about that weekend is they sent the APA, Ron Simmons, and um, a damn JBL. good entertaining team. Yeah, Oof. and they were a lot to babysit. <laughs> but I still, I got saw a JBL at WrestleMania weekend. Saw Ron Simmons too, and a Ron still. Ron came to Atlanta last year. Hung it at the racetrack for a little while with me, yeah. Oh, I missed that. So he, lived, he awesome. still lives real close to Atlanta. Funny guy. That's awesome. So how the whole car? Damn. Like, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love using those gifts on yeah. Twitter. I use them too much. How did the car, though, come together? Was that well, that like was, they um, were trying to promote something? Yeah, they were just promoting SummerSlam. And, and obviously you had the connection. Yeah, so. yeah. And my connection back then was I, uh, I was dealing with Shane McMahon, Vince's mm-hmm. son. So we started talking... Hey, wouldn't it be great? Because I was going to shows all the time back in those days, and you know, all those Steve Austin and JBL and all them, they come hunt with me all the time. So I knew all of them, and they were talking about uh, that SummerSlam may have been in Raleigh, so it was going to make sense logistically to do like the race was on Friday night, SummerSlam was two days later in Raleigh, so we could take the car. And I drove for Ed Whitaker, uh, bless his heart. Uh, that weekend, nice, nice people. Ed and Maxine were great. And um, so we ran the car and then took it to SummerSlam on Sunday. Had a big time. We'll, uh, we'll bring it back to racing here and wrap it up with a few things. What um, Going back to before, talking about you getting behind the wheel, do you still envision doing that as long as you have that no, connection? Or I, do you have it, like a, like, okay, this is when I'm not going to do it anymore? I will do, say, a Richmond or a Martinsville or a Bristol as long as it doesn't, I'm not writing any more checks to race. I'm not doing that. And as long as I feel like, um, not that I'm going to win, but as long as I feel like I'm somewhat competitive and not going to be in the way. I'm not going to, I don't want them talking about me being out there and being in the way. So as long as I feel like I can go have fun and not take away from the guys and girls that are doing it you know and not uh, i'll do it as long as i can when the opportunity arises i don't have a particular age or anything like that as long as i enjoy it and the opportunities are still there i'll do it once in a while trucks are this weekend in texas texas yeah of course you'll be there what uh you got anything else going on in in life besides truck stuff and you were recording this morning with prn yeah yeah i do i do uh, prn radio uh, fast talk every third monday night which uh, I roomed at UNC with Keith Parsons, who was Benny Parsons' son. Oh my so I've always been a big <laughs> follower and supporter of PRN Fast Talk because that was Benny Parsons' uh, baby to start with. And outside of that, chasing kids around, I've got multiple businesses at home. I've got uh, three restaurants. I want to give a shout out to everybody at Fosho. Uh, that's my sports bar there in Emporia. I passed that on the way to the Denny Hamlin uh, Yeah, short track trip, just on speed. And, and, I, and I recognized it, and it took me a minute to be, yeah. oh, that's Hermes Place. So yeah, I we've got there. Fosho, and we've got uh, Herman Elliott Sadler Victory Lane Restaurant. We've got a UPS store. We've got two Five Guys, oh my Burgers gosh. and Fries, and we've got an IHOP. So you like to be busy, in other words. Well, I, I, uh, I say we, but my wife really, uh, she woke up one day about 10 years ago when the kids started getting older and said, you know, I'd really like to have something to do. So I took care of that. So now she's got about 100 employees working for her. Oh, my gosh. So, so you've she's got having fun. Every, yeah, and again, you're having fun. Yeah, and then plus we have the family business that I'm kind of involved in. We're in the convenience store business, and we sell diesel fuel, regular unleaded gas and things to loggers and farmers and different people in our parts of the country, too. So I really enjoy that, getting to go out and call on customers and help them out and farmers and loggers do a lot for us and so I've always enjoyed you know being able to work with them also so as we record this on Monday June 4th you'll have you'll be on fast talk tonight trucks this weekend mm-hmm. and then where are the trucks after that their schedule is so sporadic I can't even yeah we got Iowa coming up uh, after that it's a double header with um, the summer stretch yeah with the Xfinity series which I'll get to do both of those races um, on FS1 you know that weekend so looking forward to that and uh, this is a big stretch for the trucks you know the summer is usually 
when it really starts to separate, you know, the teams that have it together. And as we mentioned, teams like Thor Sport that are close but are maybe just a little bit off of, say, a Salter or something like that. I'm really interested to see, you know, who's going to kind of catch fire this summer and throw their name in that, in that hat, which to me, I know there's others that want the name in the hat, but right now the names in the hat to me, as I said, are Salter and Gregson. Well, Herman, you know I appreciate you. I'm glad we got to do this. We had lunch. That's fine. Yeah, and, uh, fine. We'll have to do it again sometime. Anytime you We can always ready. find stuff to talk about. We'll have to meet up sometime at a wrestling show, and I'll I know. Get, get you in the ring. And Oh, boy. Showed a couple of things I learned a long time ago. I know. I appreciated yeah. last year when, uh, when or what was it? Or, yeah, was it last year? Late last year, getting to go to, to SmackDown. But yeah. we haven't done a show yet together. Yeah, we'll have to do so that sometime. We'll have to do it together. Well, I appreciate fun. you, buddy. Anytime. Take care.